Hey, Collabris, I'm Ben Leroy. And I'm Jason Buckholtz. And you're listening to Collabricast. I'm doing very well. How about you? Doing all right. Longtime viewers on the YouTube channel might notice that my production values are trying to catch up to your production values. I've been using a laptop from a former Eastern Bloc country that was produced in the <laughs> mid 80s using dial up internet connected to a potato, but no more. I've got actually, I've got my real camera out, I've got everything going. Here, here I thought audio. Madison was the progressive part of Wisconsin. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> definitely not. Uh, yeah, so I'm hoping that the production values are better. I've You're looking I've good, been, my friend. I've been lustily watching YouTube videos on the topic and trying to figure out like we could have a cool collaborist background, like get the green screen, make it look like we're in a studio together. I see all of the tricks of the trade that people are doing. And I'm like, we could do that on a budget. And it would look like, so viewers, uh, you might see new stuff in the future, or this might be the furthest evolution that I can maintain and we'll be there. But to more important matters, how's that weather treating you out there in the old <laughs> Bay Area? It's a little chilly. I'm bundled up. I got the fireplace turned on, the gas fireplace insert activated. Um, we got some rain here. Uh, we got about an inch of rain here over the weekend. I, however, was in a tent. Um, so I wasn't really aware of, of rain levels. I was just hearing it patter on my rain fly and hoping it let up by the morning because I was underprepared for rain. <laughs> Are you guys still kind of dealing with drought conditions there? Like a, is one inch, like a, a big deal of like good rain to get? We're always dealing with drought conditions. Any all rain is is good and helpful, but it's everything is the, there. It never isn't drought conditions anymore yeah. these days, except for in the middle of an actual giant storm. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a perpetual situation now. You know, when I think of rainy days in the Bay Area, I, I think I've told you this before, but the first time I read a paper sun, your, your novel. Um, there's all of this rain imagery in it. And I was house sitting on Cape Cod and it was raining there. And I had this like really weird disassociative thing where I couldn't tell if I was like an actual character in the book, like the audience, but inside the book, it was really, really mind bendy. And uh that's what i think of when i think of rain in the bay area so mm -hmm. somewhere underneath that inch of rain there was probably an avatar of me who was just sort of coasting by in the streets of, of the <laughs> bay area existing well i'm glad i left that impression um with my my vr my vr fiction <laughs> but yeah it's um yeah every bit is good and um Cleans out the air, knocks the pollen out. Which is what I'm hoping for because it's raining here and it's it's in the low 60s and it's hopefully getting rid of some of the pollen because there's just pollen coating everything and it like my mouth, my tongue, my cheeks, my eyes, I can just feel pollen everywhere and I don't have allergies. So it's not like even that it's causing me to sneeze or cough or have a runny nose or any of that stuff. It's just annoying. It just feels, mm. it, it reminds me for you or for anyone else who has been to New York in the summer, when you're walking through Manhattan and you just feel this level of grit, just getting mm. all over you. It feels like that. It feels really, really like that. Yep. I know that feeling. I, I, spent a little bit of time in Manhattan and I was there, I think in the summer once, and it was, I, I spent a week there for work and it, it was, it rained on the last day I was there. So I had just like that gross, sticky, heavy feeling. And then it rained and then everything was just sparkling. There was a day back when I was running Bleak House that my old colleague at Bleak House, Allison and I uh, were 
just taking like meeting after meeting. We were going to agents and other publishers and bookstores. And we're just like running around the city for 12 hours, just getting so gross. Cause it was just, <laughs> it was like 150 degrees in the shade and there's construction going on everywhere. And we got back to our hotel and the hotel's air conditioning system was out. Oh. And so it was just like, those times where you take a shower and you sweat in the shower because it's just so hot and gross and like there's no way of cooling off it just uh, it's it's a miserable experience that has stuck with me and i uh i'm i'm working through it but <laughs> that's 20 years ago and probably i'm gonna have to just Clearly. deal with it being a part of my life we'll have some scars but uh watch this segue <laughs> But that was one adventure. You had a wonderful adventure this last weekend, and I have yet to hear the details about it, but I feel like we can fit it into the scope of the podcast, and I would love to hear about it. Sure. We'll do some creative framing. Yeah. Um, Well, thank you for asking. So, yes, this last weekend, I did a a big backpacking trip in Yosemite, um, which culminated, not culminated, but a couple of the the high points of the weekend were summiting Clouds Rest, which is a peak uh, slightly under 10,000 feet, which is quite high by California standards. Um, I know that's just in, in some places in the country, that's just kind of base camp. But uh, here in the Sierras, that's that's pretty high up there. And Clouds Rest looks out over Half Dome and Yosemite Valley. So it's more the views and the altitude, really. But um, and, and then so I summited that on the second day. And then on the third day, I I camped near the base of Half Dome and and climbed Half Dome. Which if if listeners don't know about, the, I mean, who doesn't know about Half Dome? But it's <laughs> it's it's this mountain. It's a cliff. It's a, a an iconic. Actually, as I was walking there, I was thinking that there are only a handful of you know and it's not super high it's about nine it's just slightly under nine thousand feet but it's so famous just the profile of it is so it's been so photographed it's been so commemorated um i think you know maybe everest and the matterhorn you could you could rank above it just in terms of its iconic iconic power um, so climbing it is you, there's a whole cable system that you have to climb up. You, they're, they're, the trail, unless the cables are up, it's too steep and you're walking up a, a very steep granite surface and it's quite dangerous if it's, if there's any kind of moisture, if it's slippery. Um, and there's, there's this cable system with two by four planks kind of forming, something of a ladder, except the planks are about 15 feet apart. So you're, you're walking up a very steep slope in between these planks, and then you can get on these planks and rest a little bit while you're hanging onto the cables. Um, the, it was, the place is beautiful. It's unbelievable, but there, were, there was some extra significance for me personally. Over the last year and a half, I've been conducting something of a long-term hiking project uh, hiking slash meditation project where I've been, as I was climbing up half dome, I hit the 1000th, 1000th mile of this series of hikes that I've been doing for the last year and a half where I've been out and I've been by myself and in complete silence. So no, no headphones, no earbuds, no anything, just, listening, not even, even resisting the urge to talk to myself or sing aloud to, to break up the silence, just being out there and going through hundreds and hundreds of hours now of, of silence. And I'm planning to do some writing about the experience, of course, the, the, the 1000 miles is it's, it's an arbitrary line in the sand. It's just, it's an, we, we, it, a, a few episodes ago, we talked about memoir and we talked about the difference between biography and autobiography and memoir and, th- and the way that memoir encapsulates 
some type of extraordinary experience. So I just kind of decided that th a thousand was a nice round number and that I would do this and it would take me, um, I didn't, I didn't start this with that intention. It just, it just kind of evolved. I just, I got to a point in my life and this was just following my separation with my wife, a long, long-term marriage that uh, is still in the process of, of, coming to a conclusion and kind of reconfiguring itself into a, a co-parenting relationship. You know, my wife and I have two kids, but the, the marriage part really has been coming to a conclusion over the last few years. And this was <clears throat> in, in the weeks following the physical separation. It was like, it was such a new reality for me. And this was following the, the physical separation and then having the kids 50, 50, you know, the kids going back and forth, uh, 50% of the time with their mom, 50% of the time with me. So uh, it, it was a very different life that I was leading where, because, you know, for the 20 years prior to that, and even back before that I had been either married or in a long-term relationship or taking care of kids. There had been somebody there all day, every day um, that I was, you know, part of, of who I was as a decision-making person, as an entity in this world. And then all of a sudden, um, as of uh, October, a year and a half ago, that was no longer the case. And I had time and space to myself that I had no idea what to do with. Um, and I just started hiking and this was, it was, I had grown up doing a lot of that. I had taken some extraordinary backpacking trips as a young 20 something, um, had, you know, gotten away from all that as adult life set in and married life and kids and mortgages and all of those things. And um, I just kind of got away from all that. And so something in me decided to put myself back out there. And, and like I said, it, I didn't start out with the intention of having this be any kind of organized or deliberate or, or mindful thing. It was just, I have energy and there's time and I live in Northern California. I'm going to go hike. Um. And I started doing that and, and it soon evolved into, into a, a, an intentional deliberate practice of making sure that I was alone, making sure that things were silent, of taking some very long hikes um, so that I really had all day in many cases. I did a lot of hikes that were sunrise to sunset. Um, many hikes that were 20 miles plus, um, many more that were between 15 and 20 miles. And I kept track of everything. I'm, I'm kind of secretly a statistics nerd. And I have been an avid, uh, done a lot of outdoor sports like mountain biking and cycling and triathlons and running. And through those came to know uh, the different apps that you can use to track your routes and your mileage and your elevation and all those things I'd kind of use as training aids along the way for various reasons. And so I was keeping track of all of these things and I started to compile them in a spreadsheet and then I was seeing things add up. And I said, okay, I, and, and at the same time, I was going through a tremendous amount psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, and, and finding that I had that space to, to do this in and that, that quietude and that solitude, I really began to see things beginning to shift in a major way. And so for about the first half of it, I was very intentional about not thinking of it as a source of creativity or a, or a potential writing project. It was just like, I'm not even really taking notes. I'm just doing this. I'm doing this. I'm just experiencing something. I'm being as present and in the moment as I can. 
And then as things continued to evolve in through the 600, 700th mile, I, I started to realize that there was a compelling story to tell. And so I, I decided that I would set that thousandth mile as something of a goal. And then, you know, not that I intend to stop, stop this, but I do feel like it's shifting. I do feel like having crossed that there's, there's a different intention now to, to the continuation of this, but it, it was extraordinary. And I was, I was talking to this, a talking about this to a colleague that that I should just happen to hit that milestone while I was climbing this extremely iconic mountain that I've never climbed before. But not only that, I could look down from the top of Half Dome and you, you can see the valley to the west. And my very first backpacking trip I went on when I was probably 21 years old. And this was uh, something that somebody, one of my good friends, Mike, had set up. And he had this all set up, invited me along, told me what I needed to bring along. Um, neither, we both got to Yosemite, not realizing how much snow there was in the high country. And so the wilderness ranger kind of said, you guys better make sure you have snowshoes up there. This is my very first trip. So all of a sudden it's a, so I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. So we bought snowshoes at the outfitters in Yosemite Valley. And then, you know, did this three day trip that went up out of the valley and then across the North Rim and then down Yosemite Falls. And that entire route, I could see right before me from the top of Half Dome. So I could see the, uh, the ascent, I could see the trail, I couldn't follow the whole trail, but I could see the, the whole terrain of that trip, which was now, you know, a quarter century ago. And so it was a powerful moment to not only be in such a special place, but to look down and really reflect on, you know, not only the last year and a half as I've done this, this hiking and put these miles on, but also to think about the last, you know, my entire adult, I think that, I think that trip was the summer, the spring after it was either right after I graduated from college, from undergrad or, or a year later. So it was really kind of like my entire adulthood was kind of like that. <laughs> it was just a chance to kind of reflect on that was such a, a, a clear reminder of where I was and what I was doing then. And to think about the things that are different and to think about the things that are the same. So um, I have done, I think that we, a couple of months ago in an episode, we talked about uh, coaching. We talked about coaching services and I, I uh, uh, 125 miles ago or so, I hired a coach to start talking about how to write about this project. A writing coach. A writing coach. Yeah. Um, Carolyn Flynn. Uh, she's in New Mexico. She's a wonderful, wonderful coach that I've known for many years, have known many, many clients to be very happy with her. So I hired her and I said, here, this is what I'm doing. I don't really know what the story is. I feel like there's something in here, which is something that I've heard from so many people. And it was, it was just great to be on the other end of that and to be in the hands of somebody who's really, really experienced and great at that. And she had me, you know, we talked through some different storylines. We talked through some different themes. She had me write a couple of chapters. We really uh, worked on one chapter in particular um, where we, she really helped me to, to flesh out some, she helped me to create a template that I can use for the other chapters when I do sit down to, to write that. So that was that that helped me to think about the whole experience um, and to really begin organizing my thoughts and to begin figuring out where the story is, because it is there's there's a difference between having a bunch of interesting stories to tell and writing a book and, and being able to take those stories and assemble them and to create a book length narrative. It can't just be an assembly of cool cocktail party stories. Not that anybody goes to cocktail parties anymore in this day and age and at our age. <laughs> right. It's, it's eight 30. I better be asleep or getting close to it. Like I'm not at a cocktail party. I, I do right. want to just stress how important 
and how great of a discovery it is to be able to figure out what that template is, what that framework is to make sense of it, because you have so many experiences and you like want to jam everything and you, you do the like, well, I, I have to tell this and this. And so it's so important to get that, uh, like what you were talking about, like just getting one chapter sort of visualized so that you know how it'll work throughout the rest of the book. Absolutely. And once, you know, I did four phone calls with her. I spent four hours talking to her. She read, you know, several thousand words, a um, couple of chapter drafts. And by the time I came away from it, I said, like, I know how to do this now. Like, I can take what we've just worked on, what we've just developed, and I can write these other chapters. I understand how to bring these themes in. I understand how to relate them to my own experience. Um, I figured a lot out about the tone. Um, I figured a, out a lot about how to write. The other thing that she really helped me figure out was how I, I didn't I didn't want this to be a about the divorce or the marriage or the relationships. I really wanted this to be something that, you know, I wasn't, I, I, I was very made sure that I didn't want to use this project as a way to process the, the, the divorce and all that that entailed um, or, and is continuing to entail, but rather to have it be more of, I, I think that, one of my deep and abiding interests and concerns is the amount of clamor, the amount of clamor that modern life brings us, the, how, how little time and space we actually give ourselves to be quiet, to be alone with our thoughts. Um, it can be torturous and I don't think there's anybody listening to this who doesn't understand that instinct to kind of fill the space to, you know, you got three minutes in line at the grocery store, everybody's on their phones. Like there's, there's gotta be some kind of input. There's gotta be some type of thing, some type of external. And, and I'm no different. I'm not saying that I'm any different. And that was like, you know, this was a proclivity that I was really recognizing in myself that I, I made a conscientious effort to try to combat but there's all of our notifications on our phones, our email, our texts, our social media alerts, the news feeds. There's so many things competing for our attention at any one moment that it becomes very difficult to sit with ourselves quietly. And I can't do it. I can't med I can't sit still quietly. So that's why I picked walking. That's why I picked hiking. So it's like it, it, my, it, it, there's a certain amount of restlessness. I think that it assuages, assuages. I've never known how to pronounce that word. One or the other. Go ahead and say both are correct. <laughs> assuages, assuages, um, uh, you know, this certain nervous energy, the certain level of restlessness, but as I, as you know, when I'm out there, I, I find that let's say I'm on a long hike, sunrise to sunset, I'll kind of spend the first half of the morning just kind of running through stuff in my head, you know, work things, concerns about my family, whatever I'm there is to feel bad about, whatever, you know, just, just kind of thinking about life. And then, and then I get to a point where, I'm like, I'm kind of done thinking. I think my brain recognizes at some point, it's like, okay, I can't really figure anything else out more about those things right now by consciously dwelling on them. So I'm going to let them go. And then my awareness, my, my consciousness starts to be a lot more rooted in my body at that point. And then I just kind of am this physical being this animal who is moving interacting with nature experiencing temperature experiencing smells and sights and sounds um and then you know that and then i kind of go through a phase like that and then even and then that even kind of dissipates and and this is like a perfect day this is you know this is when everything works like <laughs> this is this is when things go well I can kind of move through that and into this very mindless 
but present state of being. And I think that that, that it's in, in that zone where I'm actually doing more productive, not thinking, but it just, things are falling into perspective. Things are, you know, it's in, in meditation. We talk about separating your, your, yourself from your thoughts. You know, you are not your train of thought. You are this, this being who can sit and experiencing thought, passing thoughts and experiences as these ephemeral phenomena that, that kind of catch a hold of you and then, and then release you. And so I find, you know, I find on a, on a perfect day when, when my brain and body allow me to get into that zone, um, this really interesting combination of, of, I want to say absent mindedness or mind. It's, it's this weird combination of mindful and mindless where, you know, sometimes hours will just go by and I'll, I'll look up and I don't remember having had a single thought and it's seven miles later or something. And, and I it, think that everyone has that experience driving where like, if you think about it, you're like, I don't remember the last 12 miles that I drove. It's just, there was this, you were not aware of, you were somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. You go into, go into a, something of a trance. Um, it, you know, it's almost a, uh, uh, hypnotic. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was a momentous weekend for me in, in a couple of, in a couple of ways. Um, and like I said, it's, it's kind of this, artificial momentousness in that there's nothing special about a thousand. I had a, a, a martial arts instructor a long time ago who would say, all right, we're going to do 37 pushups. And this is, so this is at UC Berkeley. This is, you know, this was at, you know, at UC Berkeley Taekwondo. So these classes are being led by professors and engineers who also happen to be, you know, Taekwondo experts, but it's, it's kind of a very cerebral approach as you might expect at a world-class university. But he would have us do random numbers of things. And then he would always remind us that there's nothing special about multiples of 10. Or so, five, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we happen to have five fingers on each hand. That, that's the basis of our numerical system. But he's like, yeah, no, we're going to do 43 pushups today. Um, so I, I recognize that the 1,000 is, is an arbitrary milestone, but even though there's no real external significance to it, it, it still gives me a way of thinking. It, you know, what it does and where it does have real power is that it encapsulates an experience for me that lets me then think about a beginning and a middle and an end. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned earlier that I, I feel things kind of evolving now um, so this has all been, these thousand miles have all been me by myself in silence. And there's something that's, yes, it's self-care and it was necessary for me, but it's also kind of self-indulgent. It's also a little bit selfish. Mm -hmm. It's hundreds of hours where I'm not really doing anything for anybody else. And this is coming off a long period of, of having been doing things for other people for, you know, a very long time, almost exclusively, but somebody built all those trails. You know, this was some, someone's out there working on building these trails and maintaining these things. And so now I feel like it's time for me to go back out there and maybe to a lot of these same places and to be part of the workforce of people who are creating these places for other people to come along um, you know, to connect with conservation efforts to, to, you know, kind of develop a, a deeper relationship with the work that goes into creating these places and making sure that they're protected and available. And I mean, I've always picked up trash wherever I've gone, but that's kind of been the extent of it. And I've been on some of these trails. It's like, that's somebody who built this, like who, I right. You know, you'll be, I'll be, 12 miles away from civilization and there's this stone staircase like who did who did this how did right. they do this somebody worked their ass off yeah. to connect this part to that part so i could just be here recreating one day yeah 
And so, um, you know, I think that's, that's the next story to, to, well, I got to write this one first and then, but that, that's going to kind of be the next exploration. And isn't that a metaphor for life is all of the people who have gone before us, who have done things, there's a very concrete example of like, you couldn't get to some of these places or it'd be much more difficult if it hadn't been for the work of someone else to put these trails there. But that's true of so many people in our personal lives and just the larger world around us. These systems have been put in place. These people have made things easier for us. They have made things accessible for us. And for me, part of my duty as a living being is to pay that back in kind for the next generation and the generation to follow and to follow is that somebody has moved the ball this far. Now it's on us to move it a little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not, you can't just pick up the ball and play with it and put it right back where, where you found it. It's the fact that there's even a ball to begin with like that's right. Someone did that. Someone figured out that like a round thing is necessary for playing a game like soccer. And then how do you stitch it so that it maintains its air and doesn't explode when someone kicks it? Like there's just so many things that we don't have to reinvent them every time we play a recreational pickup game of something. Right. And even, even the vision, you know, I've been, I've been in places where I'm just like, who, Pinnacles National Park. There is this, there is a, in central California, there is a national park called Pinnacles. And it is the remains of these lava, these volcanic explosions, these volcanic fields. There, there's these huge spires, these giant slabs of volcanic rock that just stick straight up out of the ground. It's a remarkable, remarkable place. But there is a trail called the High Peaks Trail that goes up through these these massive rocks and it's an extraordinary trail and just for somebody to have thought hey there should be a trail going up through there you know it it is with just the vision that somebody had to even dream of that in the first place and then to pioneer it and actually create it and recognizing what kind of power a place like that could have on people and and before them, somebody, something, some, something created lava. Create, like, it, and, and that's where like, we start getting into, well, I'm not sure where the origin of this is, but it exists and, and we can interact with it. Absolutely. And as, so this was actually the sample chapter that I worked on with, with Carolyn, with my coach, was about Pinnacles National Park and these, these volcanic roots. So there was these, that area, these, I'm going to start getting excited and on tangents now, but that, that volcanic field came from Southern California. So there was these massive volcanic explosions. I don't remember how many millions and millions of years ago. And it was, you know, tech, plate tectonics, this is California, of course. So the, all these volcanoes went off. There was a fault running right through the middle of this volcanic field. Uh, the, the plate to the west of it f- came northward and brought all of these rocks with them. So these massive rocks traveled underground for wow. hundreds of miles. And then they got to the place where they are now. And then they emerged from the land. Mm. and you know these are these are these are mountains now these are mountains that these huge slabs of rock that that just traveled underground like some kind of crazy subway system and then popped up where they are now and that's just you know there are so many metaphors in that process absolutely but but, but the, the earth is you know it's just on a different scale. You know, these, these rocks themselves are traveling, they're voyaging, they're being eroded. Like land is, is this isn't, you know, this isn't me changing amid this static landscape. This is, you know, the whole land is a process. And that was the other thing that I was really thinking of when I stood on top of half dome, because you can see where these, ancient glaciers carved out the land you know everything that you're seeing there was shaped 
by glacial activity and weather. And you can see streaks on all the granite from the rain and the minerals that it's releasing from the stone as it's eroding. And then they're streaking down. It's the, the whole thing. You just look at it and it's, you're not, even though that these are massive pieces of granite and from a human scale, from a human timeline, these things are, they seem permanent, but everything here is in flux. Everything here is, is changing. It's just on a, on a different scale. So you can see the paths of the glaciers that carved out the valleys. And then there are still these rivers that are flowing through, which are, you know, tiny remnants of these glaciers but there's still these mighty rivers that are continuing to erode the valleys, continuing to, you know, wear the granite down. And it's, 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 there's just so many things to think about and so many things to realize and to, and to recognize that we are a part of that. All these processes are things that are shared by people and mountains and owls and bobcats and you know everything else that's that's out there inhabiting this this place as the old proverb goes if the ocean is everything between the shores then when i'm swimming am i not the ocean beautiful <laughs> well I think you are uh, I wanted to take this opportunity, uh, your celebration of quiet nature, contemplation, writing, Northern California, to just let people know that in the weeks that follow, there will be an opportunity for one or two collaborators to maybe get some time in that area to work on stuff in a retreat setting, to work on a book and to interact with nature and to possibly even go on a hike with Mr. Jason Buckholtz and myself. All details will be forthcoming as they kind of get into focus, but keep an eye and an ear out here and on the website to let us know you're interested if you're interested when that time comes up. Very I don't have anything more. I'm so glad and I feel, I feel very blessed that you shared that story and I am so proud of you for going on that adventure. And you sent me a picture from the top of Half Dome and I was like, I just don't even think I have it in me right now to be able, it, it made me tired looking at it. So <laughs> I... I thank you for doing that journey for the both of us. And uh, I do look forward to getting out into nature and interrupting your quiet streak because we'll, I'll talk. I'm not, a, I'm not super chatty though. So I'm sure that we'll have plenty of time to, to think things through. Well, like but, I said, I feel like it's, I feel like the project is shifting now into more of a, a connectivity phase. So awesome. Do you have anything well, more you for that you your, like to I just wanted to thank you for your, your interest and for asking and, and for, um, yeah, holding the space. All right. I think that I would say, you know, I think, I guess a, a, a final thought on silence it's in the visual arts and even in music, there is, we often talk about contrast. We talk about the negative space. Um, you know, if you're a curator in a museum where you put a painting, you're thinking about the space around it, the frame, the wall, how much space there is, what it's next to. Um, I think that we don't do that enough with our own lives, thinking, really thinking about the negative space. Um, and so I think that silence really provides an opportunity for us to step back and see a greater context for our own lives and to see the negative space that's around us and to um and especially as writers especially as people whose work is words and language and communication sometimes you gotta just shut up sometimes you gotta just stop you really do <laughs> sometimes you gotta just 
you know, and it, it is a, you know, like we've talked about before, writing books and asking people for hours and hours of attention says, look at me, look what I did. Look at all these things I wrote. Look at, look at this world I created. Um, there needs to be another mode. We need to, we need to balance that against quiet and, and listening so that we know we what we're contributing to and know what we're contributing. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about it here. And yeah, thanks man. to everybody for listening. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please like, rate, review it wherever you get your podcasts. Leave some comments on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to check out our website at collaborist.org, where Jason, myself, Sarah J. Henry, and others are available to work with you on your story in progress. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks again. For story. For community. Collaborate. Collaborist. Go away, Pollen. I hate you. <laughs>